Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, the geopolitical implications of what might be a real revolution unfolding in the oil patch, as it were. Um, there's a lot of work going on now about uh, efficiency. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the policies are kind of economically irrational, but they might be having a big impact. Uh, so that's, uh, that's important. And there's also all kinds of new interesting things going on in terms of oil production and substitutes. So I want to talk about what that means uh, for the political landscape. And just by way of reminder, to orient ourselves, um, in the tripartite division or bifurcation of the energy system, the, in the electric power sector, the issues surrounding security really are about managing the grid, bringing in new sources, competition, and so on. Uh, and transportation, they're all about oil right now. It's just extraordinary the dominance that a single fuel has on the energy system. So I'd like to take half of my time here and orient ourselves factually around what's actually happening in global production and consumption of oil, and in particular the implications for the United States and all this talk about energy independence in the United States. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about three major geopolitical implications of that. So the first thing is uh, there's been a big shift in the analyst community uh, thinking about uh, the nature of the oil challenge. What I've done up here, it's always, always, often helpful in the energy forecasting business to go back and see how well we did, uh, because we're basically terrible at this. Um, we are uh, uh, Energy Information Administration, which is where these projections are drawn from, but IEA in Paris, a similar track record. Uh, EIA went back a few years ago and, and analyzed how, how good are they at, at projecting things like oil prices and production and consumption and so on. Pretty bad. They're, they're worse at projecting natural gas prices, but uh, oil they're pretty bad at. This uh, slide shows you historical data, actual numbers, total oil uh, Production and consumption, so this is the global level. The globe production and consumption every year are roughly equal because we don't trade with other planets. Uh, and the year-to-year uh, -year changes in stockpiles are not that significant. And then what I've shown here is starting in the year 2000 is the projection for the situation uh, going out into the future. And the view from 2000 when the cover of The Economist was $5 oil, question mark, that projection turned out to be not quite right. Uh, was that we, our consumption was going to keep going up into the stratosphere. And serious people, almost everybody was talking about a world today that would have 100 million barrels a day of demand, 120 million barrels of demand in the next uh, 10 to 20 years and so on. Today's actual consumption is 88 million barrels per day. It's unbelievable how wrong we've been in that projection. The situation today, of course, is changing quite a lot. Uh, this is the consensus forecast out, looking out to the future. A little more than 100 million barrels a day of global production and demand by the year 2040. This uses a model that is very, very conservative about what's actually going on in the world. So if you look at other analysts, and I think in particular the most extreme group, and just because they're extreme doesn't mean they're wrong, uh, Ed Morse's uh, group at Citi, uh, they now have projections out that, that, that imagine a world where we're in the kind of 90 million barrel per day uh, range, or maybe less than that. So that suggests that uh, global growth in oil demand could actually stop and start falling in the future. Uh, there's no place in the world where this has been more dramatic than in the United States, and I just want to show you a couple of charts about the U.S. situation, then I want to move and talk about geopolitics. Here's a picture, again, helpful to go back to history and see what were we thinking back in the year 2000, uh, and the answer is we were uh, smoking and inhaling, it appears. Here's, uh, here's historical data. Uh, here's the 2000 projection going up into the future. One thing you learn from looking at these charts is that basically the projections are made by looking in the rear vision mirror and taking some recent data and projecting them out into the future. And that's not actually how these models work, but they feel a lot like that. Um, here's the picture today for consumption, seeing consumption flat at less than uh, 20 million barrels per day. There is nobody, essentially nobody in the industry and in the energy forecasting community who thinks that we will go back to the 2007 peak level of U.S. oil consumption uh, just slightly above 20 million barrels per day. Everybody's looking at a future where consumption is down. The only question is how rapidly down. Again, this is a conservative model. So this model sees us kind of flattening out. You look at Mark's chart here and you imagine the, the uh, fuel economy standards really playing out aggressively inside the fuel fleet and you cannot, it's not implausible to imagine a world where we're 10, 12 million barrels per day of oil consumption in the United States. The production picture, Steve said in his opening remarks, has also changed dramatically. Again, here's the historical, here's real data, here's the projection which starts by looking backwards and projects out into the future. Uh, here's the actual real world situation and we've seen this turnaround here. Uh, and then projections up into the future uh, uh, 
a lot of this is, is a shale oil, so this is um, uh, the Bakken field and a bunch of other Eagle Ford uh, um, in Texas. Uh, a lot of this is wet gas. Um, uh, there's still more offshore. Uh, there's tremendous innovation going on in offshore production and so on. So you put all that together and you have, it's not implausible to see a picture where you're uh, producing oil in the United States at the kind of 10 million barrels per day range or maybe a whole lot higher. Okay, so that's the picture on the co total production and consumption side. One way to look at that uh, simply is to ask what's our dependence on import? What's a, imports? What's a fraction of uh, imports we have? Uh, I didn't show the historical data because it seemed kind of unfair at this point. Uh, but here you see projections out in the future, again, with a very conservative model of dependence on imports at 40%. It used to be uh, over 60% and projections out into the future, 70 80%. Totally different picture. And we've got a conservative model here. It is an outlier view, but it is not implausible that you could see by 2020 or so uh, independence in the United States in the sense that we're not dependent on imports. That does not mean independence in the sense that we don't depend on the market because oil is a globally fungible commodity and um, a price will still come out of a global market. That is a totally different picture than we thought was the case a while ago. And the reasons for those differences are price. When oil is $5 a barrel, uh, basically you can burn oil doing anything. You don't have to live near Target. Mark's made the strongest case I've ever heard for living next to Target. Um, you don't have to live next to Target. Uh, and you saw all kinds of bizarre behavior in the world, like on uh, Shermativa Airport in Moscow, uh, when oil was very cheap, they had a device that basically set kerosene on fire and blasted it out the front of this nozzle. And, and the ramp in the middle of the winter in Shermativa Airport was like here in San Diego in the middle of the summer, completely dry. Shermativa Airport is very cold otherwise. When oil is $100 a barrel and not five, you, you get rid of that device and you buy a plow. Um, uh, the Middle East, we're now seeing this uh, very large consumption of oil, two and a half, three million barrels a day still today, uh, of oil being used to generate electricity. Uh, every Middle East country, with the exception of Iran, which is you know, a difficult situation for other reasons, uh, is shift, trying to shift away from burning oil for electricity and shift in the direction in particular of natural gas, or in the case of uh, UAE, uh, Abu Dhabi in particular, uh, nuclear power as well. So this is, a, this is a tremendous change. What does this mean geopolitically? And I want to just walk through three possible implications, and then I'll stop. The first and most obvious one is that if the United States is not so dependent on oil imports, maybe we will pack up and leave from places that we otherwise would be engaged with. This is a hypothesis that you hear a little bit in the United States and you hear a lot overseas. I would say in particular in Japan and other countries that have in, uh, enjoyed, rightly or wrongly, the security umbrella of the United States. It is, I think, very hard to see that actually happening. The logic behind it is that uh, oil, large quantities of oil goes, go through a handful of choke points, um, and the market has characteristics of semi-vertical supply curves and semi-vertical demand curves and so on. So small shifts in supply and demand, especially supply, like an interruption caused by problems in Nigeria, 600, 700,000 barrels a day right now are offline because of civil war in Nigeria, uh, or the situation in Iran, or the Strait of Hormuz closing, which would bring offline 15, uh, 16, 17 million barrels a day, that those, that those have a big shock in the oil market and so on. Um, and it might be the case that the United States is a little bit less uh, engaged, but there are a lot of other reasons why we're going to be in the Middle East dealing with the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, uh, other interests, notably the situation in Iran, is only marginally about oil and mainly about uh, other things. Uh, the, the, the choke point that I would watch increasingly in the future is Malacca. Uh, almost as much oil goes through Malacca right now as goes through uh, the Strait of Hormuz. We don't see much oil go th going through canals, partly they're expensive in the case of Pana Panama Canal until next year. They're not big enough to take the large uh, uh, tankers. Uh, but Malacca is particularly interesting because that's where the Chinese, so much Chinese oil uh, goes through and it doesn't take more than a map and a little bit of ingenuity to see why the Chinese are so interested in, interested in the opening of Myanmar because you can build with relatively short distance and low cost a pipeline which they in fact are doing and move Already the plans are to move at least two million barrels a day around Malacca and basically overland it uh, in, in, in Myanmar. 
I think this first hypothesis that the geopolitical consequences of the United States becoming less dependent on foreign oil, that we're going to disengage from the rest of the world, I think that hypothesis has essentially no merit whatsoever. We will see over time a little bit less engagement in the world, perhaps because we've been a little bit over-engaged in some parts of the world recently, but I th almost none of that has, uh, has to do with oil. The second of the three that I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, concerns uh, economic growth. Uh, changes in the terms of production and in the cost of energy will have a very, very large impact on economic growth and on the allocation and distribution of growth uh, uh, around the world. Oil is a little bit different from most other energy forms, notably natural gas and coal, because other than a few relatively small differences, which are typically stabilized at five, maybe $10, $10 per barrel, essentially we have a global price for oil. 10, 15, 20 years ago, that was not true. Prices for oil were regulated in uh, Russia. They were regulated in China. But essentially, though, all those big markets, with a couple of exceptions, Venezuela, uh, although things are changing quickly in Venezuela, perhaps Iran and a few others uh, have regulated prices for oil. But almost the entire world economy, and certainly all the major and most productive economies, see global prices. And so the impact of shifts in energy price on uh, the overall product productivity of the world economy could be large. The differential impacts probably aren't going to be that uh, aren't going to be that great. Um, there may be some significant impacts in terms of total jobs in the United States uh, that'll probably be in, in the noise of the total size of the U.S. economy. But certainly parts of the U.S. we see this already in North Dakota. Uh, uh, we, we will see this again uh, in the communities that serve the Gulf of Mexico. These are places that have benefited enormously uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of jobs and local economic growth. They've also suffered some consequences, uh, environmental consequences in particular. So it's hard to see a, a huge impact uh, from the oil revolution in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, the allocation of jobs and economic growth around the world, although a world with slightly less oil consumption and lower prices should in a marginal way uh, be, be a world that grows a little bit faster. I will say just as a footnote, one of the places you do see a big difference is in the price of natural gas. Uh, right now, almost no natural gas is used in transportation, uh, and that's because it's very hard to compress gas and put it into a tank. And so there, there, there are natural gas vehicles around the world, but they're a tiny part of the global vehicle fleet. Um, at, if the price of natural gas stays low and the price of oil stays high, you're going to see a lot more gas in transportation. Uh, we're going to see it in natural gas vehicles, compressed natural gas vehicles. We will especially see it in long-distance trucking. There's a large network being built out right now of truck, long-haul trucks that will be fueled by liquid natural gas, so it's easier to store the gas as a liquid on the truck. We're already seeing long-distance cargo ships uh, shifting to liquefied natural gas when they move between ports that have those kinds of facilities. Uh, Sempra here has a big interest in this uh, future and so on. I just want to show you a chart to give you a sense of how staggering the changes have been in the natural gas market. Again, right now, it doesn't have anything to do with transportation. What I show in this chart is the price of crude oil. This is all normalized into dollars per million BTUs, so dollars per the energy content of the fuel. Here's, uh, here's crude oil. Crude oil price is kind of up in the $18 per million BTU range. Here's the price, uh, uh, average prices, uh, I think these are German bulk data, uh, wholesale data for Europe. Um, British gas market is a little wacky, so I don't show the British data here, but the continental European uh, numbers uh, and the Japanese numbers, and they are all more or less tracking the price of oil, and in fact that is true by contract. The bulk imports of natural gas into Japan are priced in a formula that where the main variable in the formula, it's not the only variable, the main variable in the formula is the price of oil. The situation in the United States is totally different, where we have uh, large gas supplies coming in because of shale, because of fracking and horizontal drilling. The price of natural gas in the United States has been kind of in the two to three to four dollar range, uh, and there's a huge difference, factor of three, four, five difference between the United States and Europe and Japan uh, in terms of the price of natural gas. We see this right now in industrial investment. There is a massive competitive advantage if you're U.S.-based industries that are large gas consumers uh, compared with their European and especially their Japanese uh, rivals. The last thing I'll say, and this is where I'll close, concerns what I think is the big geopolitical implication of a world that is weaning itself off oil, which is what happens to the countries that depend on oil revenues. So this slide, as I showed this this morning as well, this shows over time the ramp up in production of oil from the Middle East, 
uh, then it basically has not grown much since the 20 million barrels a day that we achieved in the early 1970s. These are the Persian Gulf OPEC members. And then prices have gone up and down. And with those prices going up and down have been a large inflation and contraction in the quantity of money that these countries get. At the same time, the expectations inside several of these countries, Saudi Arabia, I don't show on this chart Russia, but the situation is very clear in Russia. The expectations for the revenues available to do things that keep leaders in office, those expectations have grown. In 1998, the, uh, Ru the, Soviet, the Russian budget was built, state budget was built around the expectation that the oil price would be $18 a barrel. Today, it is built, nobody's quite sure, this tells you something about Russia. Today, it's built around the idea that oil will be $80 to $100 a barrel. Some Putin, for example, needs to spread a lot of this money around in order to stay into office. That is true for the Saudis. That is true to a slightly lesser degree for the leadership in Abu Dhabi. Uh, that is certainly true in Kuwait and so on. One of the ironic implications of a world that becomes less dependent on oil with lots of new oil supplies is that oil prices will be lower. And it's not implausible to imagine a future where you're looking at oil at $50, $60 a barrel long haul. And that, there are a lot of good reasons to do that. Economic productivity, there are a lot of good reasons to move off oil, uh, in particular related to climate change and other environmental concerns. One of the side effects of this, though, will be there will be a lot of countries whose entire political system is built on spreading this rent around. That model will not work. And we don't know how that's going to play out. We don't know if it's going to be like the Arab Spring, which has really turned out to be kind of an Arab nightmare for a lot of folks. Uh, whether it's going to lead to gentle political reforms inside these countries or some other kind of geopolitical outcome. But that's the thing politically I would watch most closely. Thank you.